this is Shilpa here. So today I'm going to share you a case by Compton Burnett, uh, his ladder plan. And what's interesting about most of his cases are that he has given all the different follow-ups and he's given all the different remedies that he's prescribed during the follow-ups. But there is no um, interpretation, there is no um, you know, reasoning as to why he made a particular prescription. So what I've done today is I have given my own interpretation of what could have been going on for him to be able to make that prescription and I've got researched the database from his own writings, um, Dr. Clark's writing um, because they and Dr. Cooper's writing because they formed they had a networking group, right? So they, they basically were meeting and discussing and brainstorming. And I found that really fascinating. So let's look at this case now, right? So this is a tumor of the left breast. So a case um, he saw on the 16th of April, 1888. Um, a young lady, a widow, 26 years of age, mother of two kids. Um, the kids have died and now she comes for treatment with this tumor of the breast. Now, she has this history. Menses regular but painful. Tumor is more painful at the time of menses. Uh, she's had a knock on the left breast 15 months ago and now the surgeons are recommending her operation. On examination, he found the patient had painful swelling in the outer aspect of the left breast and the corresponding part of the right breast, which was also tender to touch, but there was no tumor as such. The patient feels the tumor in the left breast is smaller than it has been, but it's now much more painful. Now, he also got some past history of anorexia, anemia. She's been vaccinated twice, measles, weak chest with history of pneumonia and bronchitis, uh, low fever, and obviously lots of grief. So, that was it. That was his history and you can just see what stage one is all about. You know, get the past history, list all the complaints, examine, look at what's the problem and that was it. So let's see the prescriptions. Now I think the follow-ups have been uh, mostly followed for the period of one and a half years. So the first time she comes back, um, oh sorry, this is the first consultation and he gives her Ignatia uh, in a 1X and bellisperinus. Now most of his prescriptions, if he is not given what potency it's at, it's really low dilutions and low uh, mother tinctures. So we're assuming even bellis is in a very, very low decimal scale. So obviously the Ignatia would have been for the grief, you know, loss of her children and her husband and bellis. Uh, it's known as a question mark cancer here. So it's just you no know, blow to the breast cancers resulting from trauma. So that was how he started off with. Let's see what happens next. She comes back in a month, I think, and the patient is much more brighter and better. Now the tumor is quite painful and more defined. Now here he chooses to give Thuya in a 30 potency. Now that's his theory of vaccinosis, where he, if there is a past history, which she has, of any vaccination, then he assumes there has been an ill effect since vaccination and he gives Oh, uh, And that's what he does. So that's the next one. She comes back after again a month. She's in much better health, but now she's got these really um, bilious headaches. So he gave her sorinum. Again, what he calls as a zoic remedy, uh, and he writes about sorinum where he mentions it's a prominent symptom of headache. It has a prominent headache when they're hungry or when there is an associated biliousness. So that was possibly the reason why he gives sorinum 30. Now, if you're following, what he's doing is, what is the new complaint and what's the new thing that's coming up? And that's the next remedy there. So she comes back and she says, again, after a month, and she says that at first the lump swelled a good deal and then it went down. But she's still very yellow and bilious and the tumor is quite painful. So he gives her hydrastis canadensis. Now hydrastis is known for precancerous and cancerous state. 
especially with a strong action on the liver. It's useful for bilious affections and intense jaundice. So I think that's on his mind. There is this yellow biliousness which is coming up quite strong with liver affections. She comes back after a, com uh, a couple of months here and she thinks does, she does not think there's any real improvement in hydrastis. So he gives her Sperum picricum 3x. Now, three drops in water at night and in the morning. Now, I found some information in Dr. Cooper's writing where it's a liver medicine with associated biliousness and anemia. So, if you see, these are really basically organ working on a specific organ remedies with this action on the liver, with biliousness, with anemia together coming, and that's the sperum picricum. So she comes back after again two months and she says, I'm quite well. Now, if you have noticed, every time she mentions I'm quite well, which means there is no immediate need for something to actually intervene, he gives an antimyosmetic remedy, which he calls the Zoic remedy. So now he gives her Bacillinum 3. Now, if you look into the past history, there is this history of anorexia with this chest affections and, you know, the weak chest and... So what he's doing basically is taking all these different past history complaints and intervening them and addressing them with a specific antimyosmetic medicine and considering them to be a block there. So he writes about Vaselinum because it's proved by him and he says it's an intercurrent cause, makes a wonderful change in people with personal or family history of chest infections. She comes back um, in a month later and she says she's had a very bad bilious attack and the tumor has now again increased in size. So he goes back to hydrastis. Hydrastis, I think, for him is cancerous state with its affection on um, the liver and the gallbladder, the organ remedy for biliousness. So he goes back to hydrastis. She comes back. Now again, two months later, so this is the next year in Jan, and now she says the tumor is nearly gone. I have difficulty finding its remnant, but she looks a bit pale and bilious. So he gives her ruby carting Torah. Now he found that this is a great remedy for an engineer specific for anemia with undernourished conditions. So basically he's called it splenic anemia. So this is like a tonic for anemia. That's what he calls it. And that's what he gives her because now there is no tumor as such. She says the tumor is still gone. Uh, it's just pain which, you know, makes her, I mean, that's what is evidence right now. It's more the pain rather than the bulk because the bulk's really disappeared. Um, at this moment, he doesn't, he's now not really looking at the tumor because for him, the tumor has been addressed with whatever remedies he's, he's given the cancerous remedies like the hydrastis, the bellis perineus, they are and they were his organ remedies. What he's addressing is basically all the zoic remedies or all the nozos. Now if you realize here he's combining stage three which is that nozod with stage one which were the organ remedies. So now he's just addressing each of those past history. Now she had a history of measles in the past and if that was a, uh, an obstacle he addresses that with morbillinum 30, which is the measles nozode. He repeats it again um, in April, and that was what it was about the measles nozode for him. And then she comes again a two months later, and the pain's gone, the tumor's gone. But he gives her Sabina 30. Now, I was wondering what was it that made him give, suddenly give an organ remedy for the female reproductive system and then I found that this tumor was always aggravated uh, around the menstrual period. So there was some sort of a connection with, um, there was some sort of a disturbance for him at an organ uh, at the uterine level. So he uses a remedy which is um, known for its action on the, on the uterus and Sabina is known as an anticurate. That's what I studied when I was looking, um, you know, it's a homeopathic cure. It cleans up the uterus, um, especially if there has been some issues there. So that's what he gives her, and that has been the last follow-up that she, he saw her. The patient continues to be well, 
and has no tumor. So I hope you, you it is an interesting ride. Uh, basically, he's seen her every month or two months and each time he's changed a remedy. And it's fascinating to see the way he uses um, an acute organ remedy every time and, and, altern and not alternating, I would say. And, and, and when she's fine at an organ level, he uses uh, an antimyosmetic remedy, which is the Nozod, um, depending on what past complaints she's gone. So if you go back and look, every past complaint has been addressed in some form. So let me show you uh, what was that past history there. And we'll, we'll see what's happened here. So if I go back and look at... Um, so this is basically her chief complaint, and he he introduced for the breast action on the breast. He introduced Bellis pill, and then later on, all he was doing was using the past history and each of these complaints for anorexia and for the weak chest. He gave vaselinum for anemia. He gives he gives rubia for the vaccination history. He gives thuya for the measles. He gives morbillinum. Um, again, the low fever um, and the grief. Basically, the grief, the low fever was a tubercular affection with the weak chest, but the grief was Ignatia. So, he's actually had a plan. I was, you know, you might think it's random what's happening there, but there was a sequence, there was something, and it's wonderful to think without any core remedy in that constitutional way, he still managed to do what he did. So, I hope that gives you an insight into what stage one homeopathy is all about, and just help us acknowledge and appreciate the work um, and the spectrum of what it is uh, to be working as a homeopath. Thank you very much and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.